President Biden spoke Thursday about the ceasefire agreement between Israel and Hamas. CBS News senior White House and political correspondent Ed O'Keefe has the latest from the White House. President Biden tonight welcomed the news of a Middle East ceasefire. And I send my sincere condolences to all the families, Israeli and Palestinian, who have lost loved ones and my hope for a full recovery for the wounded. Until tonight, the president has said very little in public about the violence. I believe the Palestinians and Israelis equally deserve to live safely and securely and to enjoy equal measures of freedom, prosperity and democracy. The White House has focused in recent days on what it calls quiet, intensive diplomacy behind the scenes. I believe we have a genuine opportunity to make progress, and I'm committed to working for it. Mr. Biden has spoken with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu six times since the violence began, and today with the president of Egypt, part of the administration's more than 80 calls to Mideast leaders in the past week. Ed O'Keefe joins me now from the White House. Ed, what else is the White House saying about this ceasefire? Well, Lana, they would point out that this comes after about 11 days of what the administration has described as quiet, intensive diplomacy that's gone on mostly behind the scenes, over telephones, possibly Zoom calls, all of it designed to keep this from turning into a longer term, far more violent and deadly situation. Senior administration officials telling CBS News the president's falling back on his decades of experience and deep contacts across the Middle East and understanding that Things can change very quickly, can escalate quickly if they're not addressed as fast as possible. In this case, the United States has been in close coordination with Egypt, in part because the United States doesn't officially engage with Hamas, which it considers to be a terrorist organization. So Egypt serves as the interlocutor between the two countries and helped orchestrate this ceasefire that is taking place tonight. But the other thing that the White House has been sensitive to over the last several days is the criticism from members of the Democratic Party about how the president was responding to and talking about this situation. As you are well aware, Lana, the domestic politics are changing such that Democrats increasingly of a certain generation and certainly of the far left ideology believe that the United States has to be far more equitable in dealing with the Palestinians and far tougher on the Israelis. Well, the White House points out that the president never really budged off of his position, both publicly and in private, in part because, as one senior administration told me, the president, quote, has always believed it is not effective to take on your allies in public. So they held the Israelis close, allowed them to get to this point where a ceasefire is set to begin, and now the tricky work of diplomacy that will involve the United States likely to some extent can begin. Hmm. Uh, let's switch gears now, uh, because President Biden also signed a new law on Thursday aimed at protecting Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. But there's actually some opposition to this legislation by Asian and LGBTQ organizations. Tell us what's going on. Well, let's start with the positive. First off, this law passed with overwhelming bipartisan support, 94 to 1 in the Senate. They can't even get to agree to have lunch with that kind of a vote these days, so that's notable. More than 360 <laughs> votes in the House, Democrats and Republicans on board. What the law does is establish a new Justice Department office to investigate hate crimes, sets up funding and a mechanism to help states establish hotlines to report hate crimes, and then also provide more training to local law enforcement on how to identify those cases and work towards preventing them in the future. Future. But yes, hundreds of Asian AAPI LGBTQ organizations oppose this legislation in part because it does nothing to further clarify what the federal government defines as a hate crime. This has been a push, especially from the gay rights community in recent years, to put something in writing in federal law that establishes what it is. But they ultimately didn't do it in this case, instead pushing to address what has become a real notable problem in the country over the past 15 months since the pandemic began, this scourge of anti-Asian attacks across the country, more than 6,500 of them reported, likely thousands more across the country. Just today in New York City, they arrested a man who allegedly attacked an Asian man earlier this week, bit his finger off, part of it and told the man allegedly, go home to your country. It's those kinds of cases this law is designed to prevent and address the president saying he was quite proud to see Congress move quickly to pass it. Yeah, some criticisms of the parts of this legislation that were not specific. Uh, so to follow up on that, Ed, I'm wondering if you can give us some specifics. Do we know the timeline yet for this new Department of Justice office that will handle these hate crimes? When can local law enforcement begin taking advantage of these federal grants? Uh, have any of those details been nailed down? 
Not quite, because this is what you would call the authorizing legislation. The appropriating or the spending legislation will come later. So likely, the office will be established in the coming months. The money might not become available until next year at some point. But either way, uh, considering how tricky it is to get things done in this town these days and to get the two sides to agree to anything, it is notable that it took only just a few months to write this legislation, get it passed, get it through the two chambers with an understanding that something had to be done to address what has become one of the most unfortunate outgrowths of the pandemic. Hmm. Well, Ed, also on Friday, President Biden is planning to meet with South Korean President Moon Jae-in at the White House. What can we expect during that meeting? This is the kind of foreign policy the president wants to be focused on. Asia, concerns about China, the rise of China across the world, and of course the situation in North Korea. This president so far hasn't spoken much publicly about what was one of the most uh, active issues in terms of foreign policy for the Trump administration. He's trying to strike a balance somewhere between the full-on engagement that the Trump administration have and the sort of weighted out policy of the Obama administration, figuring that there's got to be something in the middle that can be worked out. So that's likely to be part of these conversations, conversations as well about China and its influence across not only the Far East, but the rest of the world. This is the second in-person meeting the president has had with a world leader. The first was the prime minister of Japan. And again, all of this signals that this is an administration trying to focus much more on Asia, the rise of China, how it's influencing its neighbors and the rest of the world. It's these issues like the Middle East or ending the war in Afghanistan that are designed to sort of discount those issues and reset the United States to make it realize it's got to be focused on that part of the world if it's going to be competitive this century. Lana? Hmm. All right, Ed, always appreciate your insights. Thank you. Take care.